Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Premier Health Talks. If this is your uh, second session of the day, welcome back. I'm Fabiana Bacchini, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, CPBF, and your host for this event. The Premier Health Talks is the first international live series that CPBF is hosting in 2021. These educational sessions are in collaboration with the Family Integrated Care Committee, the Canadian Association of Neonatal Nurses, the Canadian Neonatal Network, the European Foundation for the Care of Newborn Infants, EFCNI, and GLANCE, the Global Alliance for Newborn Care. For those not familiar with CPBF, we are a charitable organization, and our mission is to empower families of premature babies every step of the way through support and education. We believe that through consistent information, access to helpful resources, and peer support inside and outside the NICU, we can empower families, ensuring they are ready to care for their babies. For this Premier Health Talks, we brought health experts from around the world and from all over Canada. We'll be diving deep into topics affecting Premier Health, from breastfeeding to parental mental health during the pandemic, from the importance of kangaroo care to the best practices to protect your baby's skin. If you need closed captioning, you can watch it live from our YouTube channel and enable closed captioning on the screen. And I want to thank our sponsors, Medela, Water Wipes, and Prolacta Bioscience. And please uh, interact with us, send your comments or questions on the comment session below. And today we're going to have, after this presentation, Dr. Takeshi Arimi to talk about chances and challenges of tiny babies. And right now I have here uh, with me, joining me live from Calgary, uh, Karen Lasby. She's going to talk about feeding uh, concerns uh, after the NICU discharge. So feeding concerns are very common after babies leave the NICU. In this presentation, we explore signs of feeding trouble that commonly occur in early weeks after an ICU discharge, and we'll describe easy strategies for parents to implement at home. Karen uh, is uh, a nurse in, a four years, uh, in her four-year career, has helped her become an expert in the support of premature babies and their families after the ICU discharge. Karen has made presentations locally, nationally, and internationally, and she has written and taught online courses to educate nurses about how to care for babies in the NICU. She has also been a research co-investigator and has published articles related to premature babies. And she served on the executive boards of the Canadian and International Associations for Neonatal Nurses. Karen, her colleague, Tammy Sherrill, co-authored an essential parent book for Parents of Premature Babies titled Premi Care, A Guide to Navigate the First Year with Your Premature Baby. Karen, thank you so much for joining us here today. Always a pleasure to have you and to talk to you and have your knowledge shared with our families. I'm very grateful that you took the time to join us today. Oh, I, I very much look forward to these these talks. So, um, yeah, let's let's get started, shall we? Yes, uh, you can share your screen, Karen. And for all of you watching us from home, you can please send your comments and questions, uh, and Karen will answer them after our uh, her presentation. Okay, here you go, Karen. You can go on a slideshow now. You're good. Uh, no. Okay, no. so you see all your slides. Are you in full screen? I'm in full screen. Okay, try to move one slide, see what happens. Sometimes works. No. Okay, let me try to share my screen to okay. see if it works a little better. So you can have your full slides here. Let's see. Okay. You know, technology happens. <laughs> Okay, here you go, Karen. It's all yours. Just let me know when I need to move your slides. Um, you can actually move to the next slide. I mean, it, feeding feeding uh, problems are the number one concern of parents after they take their baby home from the NICU. Um, it is the meat and potatoes of, of work in the community with premature babies. And I want to just start with an example. You know, parents, you've spent um, days and weeks and months in in the NICU, your baby might have been a a 23 weeker or a you know 36 weeker, and you're taking your baby home now, and um, 
you know, the first couple of days, you've got your NICU plan, um, you're all psyched up, you've been practicing in the NICU, and a day, two, three days later, suddenly breastfeeding is not going well. Um, now your baby is spilling, now your baby is coughing, choking, maybe your baby's falling asleep during feeds, not taking enough, so you're, you know, is the bottle wrong? So you go out and you buy a dozen different kinds of bottles in the market, you try every one of them and nothing seems to work. Feedings are not fun for anyone. They're not fun for your baby. They're not from fun for the parents. No one's enjoying it. It's not supposed to be a pleasurable thing and no one's enjoying themselves. Everyone's stressed. And when we look at these scenarios like this, we know through the research, we know that feeding stress impacts um, the baby's long-term relationship with food. So the baby's going, I don't like this, you know, and, and they start to rebel. Um, and, and also feedings impact the family. They impact um, the mother's uh, confidence, the father's confidence, um, the relationship between um, family members, um, the mood in the house, you know, oh, no, it's feeding time. Oh, no, look out. You know, here, here we're stressed again. You can go to the next slide. So we want to avoid that, right? And there's things that people can, parents can do um, without, before they even whisk off to see their healthcare provider, because goodness knows, and certainly in these times of COVID, um, you know, the more you can fix at home, the better. So that's starting off right. We know that that NICU discharge plan is really only good for a couple days. Your baby changes, your baby wants more. And if you have one of those discharge plans that says, feed your baby every 60 mils every three hours, that's not going to work very long. Your baby is going to say that that is underfeeding me now and I demand more. So the plan needs to change. So we know that when babies go home, they're not efficient. They're not proficient. They're not expert at feeding. They're good enough to go home. And as they age at home, as they get more and more mature, things change. Their mouth gets stronger. They can suck stronger. Um, and uh, and now they're drawing more milk in, whether that's from breast or bottle. They can get them into trouble when maybe they weren't in the NICU. So feedings need to be pleasant. So we start off saying no big changes. Uh, don't say, I'm going to change the next six things because then you, when you're evaluating it, you don't know what's worked and what's not one change at a time. Say, so today I'm going to try this, or this half day I'm going to try this certain strategy, and then let's see how it goes. And then unfortunately your baby's going to change tomorrow, and you're going to have to kind of start from square one, because they're a moving target, these babies. They, they like to keep us on our toes. No coaxing, no pushing, no force feeding. We want feedings to be pleasant. We want your baby to decide when to feed and how much to feed. And one thing I suggest is that you just write things down. You know, you're used to seeing things written down in the NICU. Get a piece of paper or get an app um, on your phone and just start recording. How's the baby doing at the breast? How's the baby doing at the bottle? If you're tube feeding at home, keep track of all of that because when you go see your healthcare provider, they're going to ask for details and you're going to feel a little sleep deprived and remembering, you know, four or five days ago, it might be a bit of a challenge for you. So have things written down so you can just say here, <laughs> you can see for yourself. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So we've been talking a little bit about breastfeeding, the importance of early pumping. Um, breastfeeding, um, I can't, I could spend, you know, a day talking on breastfeeding. So I'm just going to share two key points. Um, so if your hope is to advance breastfeeding, Number one, make sure that your milk supply is there. That will entail pumping. That will entail mums looking after themselves. Make sure your milk supply is there. If it's not, go and see a lactation consultant or breastfeeding clinic to get that support. And then second point is going to be get the baby in the kitchen. Get the baby on the breast. So in the NICU, you may have been breastfeeding one or two times a day. Or if your uh, baby's a very lucky baby, maybe you're breastfeeding more often in the NICU and spending more time there. But there's no perfect way to advance breastfeeding. So we recommend um, just getting the baby there. So let's say you're breastfeeding a couple times in the NICU. Stick with that, but start adding some practice time. So just get the baby on there for a couple minutes while the bottle's warming um, so that they get lots and lots of practice so that they're you know, learning from one or two breastfeeds a day is really challenging. But if you're practicing most feeds, then you're going to be able to start advancing. But finally, seek a guidance from your community um, supports. Uh, you're, you're good. You're good. Thanks for advancing. 
So how do you know when feeds are going well and they're not going well? So let's start off with the not going well. The baby is restless. They're moving their arms all about. They're they're active. Um, they're they're arching back. Um, their their face looks stressed. They're like this is scary. Um, um, they're coughing. They're choking. They're gasping for breath. They pull off the bottle or the breath. They're going. Ah, I have to take that breath. They're spilling. They're noisy and sloppy when they're drinking. They don't take enough. They fall asleep in the middle of the feed. They're feeding faster than 15 minutes, so they're getting it in, you know, five minutes flat, or they're taking an hour. And gosh, we certainly see that happening. Um, and they awaken after a short sleep, so less than an hour later, they're up again going, I'm hungry. So things, something's going wrong here. So instead, we want to have a calm baby who has a relaxed face, who's making mm -mm 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 sounds on, on the, uh, while they're feeding at breast and bottle. Small little drops are okay. We want them to be full and satiated at the end of their feeding. We want them to feed in about 15 to 30 minutes, not too fast, not too slow. And we want them to sleep one to three hours. And notice it does say one to three hours. Full-term babies feed about that often. So in the NICU, your ex-prem may have been fed every three hours in the NICU, but is what, what is normal is being fed every one, two, three hours. Um, so if a baby wakes up after two hours with hunger cues, they're the boss and they get fed. Next slide. So the most common problems that, that I see in, in premature babies after NICU discharge is that they fall asleep before finishing the feed. Um, and so the family says, well, I was supposed to give them 60 and they're falling asleep at 40. What do I do? And just click that one more time. And what happens often is parents are stressed and they're saying, oh, no, in the NICU, Somehow my baby was drinking 60 mils every three hours, and now I can only get them to, to drink about 40. And so they're doing coaxing methods, and those snowball, those end up being problematic. So we want to have um, really positive, positive um, interactions with feeding. So we, we're going to try to avoid that heavy coaxing. So next slide. So first off, consider your baby's corrected age. So if you're taking home uh, a baby who is close to your due date, that's a full-term baby, and those babies are fed every one to three hours. So th it's not awful if they're waking up every one and a half to two hours and saying, I want to eat. Small frequent feeds are actually a great strategy for babies. They think, I can handle this. My tummy feels great. I got lots of nutrition. Um, it's just a lot more work, but it is very satisfying for these babies to feed frequently. Watch those early hunger cues. At the beginning, they're very subtle and they kind of, and that's it. And they go, okay, I'll go back to sleep. But we want to act on those early cues and we'll say, oh, are you awake? You know, do you want to try a little bit of breastfeeding? Do you want to try a bottle? Um, and so catch those early cues. They will get stronger as your baby gets older. And as uh, uh, one mom uh, that I spoke to not too long ago, she said, my baby is like a light switch. They're, it's dark, asleep. And then, bing, the switch goes on and my baby is gone ballistic and I need to eat now. And, and she says, i got to find those early cues because um, this is, uh, the baby's just too frantic to eat and to latch onto the breast. Um, wake up the body and not the mouth. So when your baby is falling asleep at the bottle, um, resist the temptation to move that bottle. No wiggling, jiggling, moving in and out. I know that makes the baby start sucking again, but this is not a good practice for your baby. What I would suggest instead is wake up the body. So you give them a little rub down. Say, hey, how about a little burp break? Or, or if you need a little cat nap, that's okay. I'll lay you down in a safe location. And then let's come on up until you cue again. So wake up the body talk to them, sing to them, um, and help them arouse by themselves. Change the diaper mid-feed. I really like this strategy. Parents informed me of this strategy decades ago, and I it's my go-to. Um, if you're saying your baby falls asleep mid-feed, I suggest when your baby wakes up next, start breastfeeding or bottle feeding your baby first. Feed for about, you know, whatever, 5 to 10, 15 minutes. Come up for a burp break carefully change their diaper you don't squish them their legs over just kind of carefully change their diaper and now they're going to be invigorated again and then say okay here's part two let's finish this feed 
I've already talked about burping and lying the baby down um, until they cue again. So again, mums will say, well, you know, he falls asleep after five or 10 minutes of breastfeeding. I'm saying, okay, so let's do the diaper change midway. But then that's also okay, that that didn't work. Okay, he's, he's baby's had a partial feed, burp time, holding up a little bit. Now just lay down uncovered in a safe location in your bassinet or your crib and saying, you just think about your breakfast there and I think you want, you'll want a little bit more. And I guarantee in about five or 10 minutes that baby's gonna go, wait a second, I'm not done. Um, and we'll continue again. Maximum 30 minutes feeding time. So not including your burp time, but let's just say maximum 30 minutes of extra. Think of feeding like exercise. You know, you, if you over-exercise, you overdo it, and then you're exhausted for the day. Um, let's say 30 minutes of active feeding time. So maybe it's 30 to 40 minutes, you know, counting burp time. But you don't want to be spending an hour feeding your baby. And the next slide. The second most common challenge that I see um, oh, wait, I, I just want to show him the golden retriever holding the bottle ever so still there. You just captured that. Okay, the second most common feeding problem that I see, particularly uh, problematic for bottles, is we call it flooding, which means they're spilling, they're drinking too fast, they get kind of milk some cotton in their throat, and they start coughing, they might choke a little bit. Um, so we want to um, see, can we do something to prevent this from happening? And certainly if you're breastfeeding, a lactation consultant will give you ideas on how to lessen that letdown. Um, you might need a pump first or lay back so that the, the baby isn't rushed with that milk quite so much. But at the bottle feeding, know that, and at breastfeeding, know that suck strengthens over time. I've mentioned that earlier. And so we, this baby is getting stronger and stronger. And so we really want to say it's normal to suck hard and fast on the breast. That's what the brings the milk down, but it can cause trouble on the bottle. Um, so what we recommend is um, make sure they're on a nice slow flow bottle. You can switch to the next slide. Um, and just we want to make sure that we have them positioned. In, uh, I really like that side lying position, the two pictures at the bottom, um, so that the bait pillows under the body, they're laying so side lying, they're in that nice sniffing position. Um, high cradle, that bottle can drip. You can go to that next slide. And then those bottles, oh my goodness, this is a nemesis for parents. It Bottles are a common reason for uh, feeding problems for, for our ex-prems. Different shapes, different flows. No, no flow is the same between bottles. It's a scary show out there. Um, and so next slide. What you want to choose is a bottle where your baby can have a really nice latch. This is not a good latch. This baby is just like right on the little nub. So this is one of the reasons why I avoid wide bottles because they often have that little narrow pointy end and the baby just latches on that. If you go to the next slide again. So instead, what we're looking for is that nice, soft latch on the on the nipple. Um, so there we go. So very similar on that on that left hand side, you can see pink, a little bit of pink on the top and the bottom. Oh, just back up a little bit. Um, and then with nice latch, nice relaxed face. And we don't want them on that little tip again it's on that right hand side. OK, next slide. So start the commercial nipple in the NICU. Oh, that's revolutionized uh, the transition home for families. Slow flow, narrow, get, get it working in the NICU before you take your baby home. Um, warm the nipple on the bottle. It warms, gets a little bit of pressure in the bottle. So just before you give it to your baby, unscrew the top, get it back down again so it doesn't splash all over your baby's face, not too fast. The tightness of the collar does affect how tight, how, how it flows. So if you want it to be really slow, you tighten it up. If you want it to back off a little bit to make it a little bit faster. A full bottle will generate more pressure and faster flow. So keep that in mind if you're filling up those bottles. Um, nipple, nipple integrity does change over time. Um, so those commercial nipples that are made out of silicone, they do break down over time. So you might need to replace them. And just be careful when you go up to that faster flow nipple because it could be a big change. Okay, next slide. Just a couple more slides here. Here's the bottle. Okay, next slide again. So one of the strategies that we have for babies who just like to rush on the bottle, they rush on the breast, that's great, but rushing at the bottle does not work. And so if you see your baby with these signs, they're squirming, they look worried, they're spilling, um, drinking very fast, then just pull the nipple out. So, you know, one, two, maybe three to five sucks. One, two, three, and then pull that bottle straight out, rest it on your baby's lip, and then just let them 
swallow, they'll open their mouth again and say, okay, continue. But if, you know, until they start doing that pausing, we do that pacing for them and it really helps slow down that feed. Okay, next slide. And so the baby is the boss. You know, our takeaway messages are we want a positive feeding experience. We want to transition to Q-based or infant-led feeding. That means different volumes, different times. That is normal. Um, watch your baby for hunger cues. Watch them for satiation cues. Um, use, um, you know, keep your breast milk in. Um, you reach out to lactation consultants and breastfeeding um, um, clinics. Um, use your bottle feeding strategies so that we can optimize, uh, make that feeding as, as pleasant as possible. And then the final slide there. There. Sorry, Fabiana, for making you do all that switching around there. But um, thank you for inviting me. Um, um, feeding is a number one challenge. And, and certainly in our book, uh, Premie Care, we spend so much time talking about feeding, whether it's breastfeeding or, or bottle feeding. So she's got the website there if you want to go for more information. But um, feeding is, is the number one concern. So I'm don't be surprised if it's top of list for you as well. Um, but there's so many, you know, try some of these strategies out. Well, Karen, thank you so much for your presentation. Yes, yeah, sorry about the slides because I'm monitoring two computers and, and uh, comments. Uh, but always so great uh, to have you and sharing your expertise with our families. So I guess my first question to you is because we leave the ICU on a schedule. Baby has to feed every three to four hours, and then I see you. How is that transitioning home? Like, do we switch off the schedule to go with baby cues right away, or you wait a few uh, days, a, a few weeks, until baby's more adjusted at home? So, good question, because uh, that comes up always. Um, so the transition is difficult and it's more difficult for parents than it is for babies. So I would start off saying watch your baby for cues. Um, so just because now they're, they're in your home 24 hours a day, you can really watch for those cues. If they are reliable and they're in, in other words, they're rousing that you can hear them, then follow those cues right away. Um, if they are, are not, if they're very silent or subtle or you just don't notice them at all, then you stay on a semi demand so that maybe after about three hours you just kind of undress your baby saying do you want to wake up now and let them kind of arouse on their own so don't just pick them up and say let's feed because it's been three hours let's see if they can arouse on their own and then finally I suggest that you take your let's say you're taking 60 mils times eight that's 480 mils per day that is a, a, a reasonable goal for your baby to drink for for some babies and so I would suggest you start writing it down and so then as your baby is feeding 40 mils here and 70 mils, they're like different amounts, different time. You look over 24 hours and go, you know, not bad. He's within 50 of that goal. That's good. So let's try again tomorrow. And so you just kind of look at your 24 hour goals rather than that one feed. And, and you know, if 60 mils goes in, you know, that's not the measure of success. The measure of success is over time. Does your baby accommodate it? Because you may find your baby is more hungry in the morning, more hungry in the evening or all night or all day. Um, so every baby is different. Karen, but for babies who are exclusive breastfeeding, not taking any bottles, how moms can or parents can reassure the babies are taking enough and gaining weight, especially this time where the appointments are not as often in person as they used to be? Yes. Um, so... I mean, a couple options are looking at the normal things. Are they wet every diaper? Are they um, are they having regular bowel movements? Um, is your baby generally behaving comfortably? Um, is your baby fussy all the time? Um, so we're looking for you know signs of dehydration or irritability or lethargy because your baby's not drinking enough. Um, and then finally, you know there are locations um, that you can. Um, uh, loan a scale or, or rent a scale or maybe there's a you know um, with, with COVID you have to phone around and see is there a place that you can actually um, get some follow-up like in a breastfeeding clinics are often really good at getting some th this ongoing support for families so um, yes it's really hard not to have that weight um, regularly um, but maybe once a week might be sufficient for your families um, for that are exclusively breastfeeding. Okay, we have a great question here from Nina. When home should the baby be woken up at night to feed if she isn't waking up on her own? This is such a good question. I think all parents 
need to know that. Is it safe to let the baby sleep through the night without feeding in the beginning? Okay. Um, first off, yay, your baby's sleeping longer at night. That's fantastic. <laughs> so many times I hear families say the baby's sleeping well during the day and not at night. But that's a whole other question or another whole topic. Um, so what I would suggest is, again, look at those 24-hour volumes. And so at 10 o'clock at night or 8 o'clock at night, you're going, yeah, you know, he's kind of close to what the baby was supposed to be drinking. Um, then, um, then you're good. Um, say, let the baby sleep. And then you start again next next day. So if your baby is, you know, maybe if the weight gain is inadequate and your doctor or your nurse is concerned about weight gain or growth, um, you know, maybe by late evening, you're kind of going, yeah, I better wake her up in the middle of the night for a feed because she's not really, you know, getting enough during the day. So it really depends on overall how your baby is doing growth wise and by um, by just general their intake. So I, I, I really suggest um, doing an intake um, diary for a while um, until so that you can feel confident that the, at 10 o'clock at night that when you put your head down on the pillow, you go, I'm just going to let her wake up by herself. And that is every parent's dream. So I only say wake up your baby at night if they're not gaining weight well, and they're not achieving their target ranges, and the physician or, or nurse is concerned for your baby's uh, weight and growth. Absolutely. One more question here from Diane. Uh, as babies learn to suck their thumbs, how can I differentiate this action as a hunger sign or the baby discovering a new body part? Great question, Diane. Yeah. Absolutely. And they love to put their hands in their mouth. And so, um, you know, you're going to have to almost look for other cues um, and uh, kind of look at their their the time a little bit and, and look at other cues. And, and just sometimes parents will just say, well, I offer it. Um, and the baby took only 20 mils. That's all they, you know, so he really wasn't hungry. He just kind of took a little bit. So you're going to have to experiment. Um, every baby is different, but, um, yeah, absolutely. Sucking on those fingers and, uh, can, can be kind of confusing as they get older and can get their hands up in their mouth. So, um, uh, you're just going to have to experiment a little bit. Absolutely. Karen, uh, can you talk a little bit about your book? I'm sharing the, the cover of your book here with our audience because your book has yeah. so many great strategies and great information for fans. We absolutely love the book. Thank you. Um, Tammy and I put our heart and soul into this book and 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 we used a we tapped into um, a dozen families, um, mums and dads who have have gone through the journey of taking your baby home from the NICU. We have their comments, you know, just th throughout the entire book, just to kind of make this book come alive. So it was, uh, um, it, it's a book that's meant to be practical um, for families to have strategies right from right from a book and, and not have to rush out to a healthcare provider. Um, it has really been, um, uh, you know, parents are almost wishing they had it in the NICU when we do recommend the first, we weren't even going to include the NICU experience, but fam our family, team said no you got to talk about you know t having your baby in the NICU so we started there and sometimes families will get our book after they've left the NICU and they think oh I wish I had had it before so um, yeah I would just say share the word um, we've got uh, really good um, positive results um, and feedback on on uh, on Amazon and so if you're happy with the book I would we'd love to have your review uh, online because parents just love seeing another parent's viewpoint on on our book absolutely Karen thank you so much for joining us here today always great talking to you and uh, obviously share your book with our families because I think this book is so great for everyone in the NICU thank you and happy to talk to you thank you and for all of you watching us from our YouTube channel or Facebook, thank you for joining us. I know we have an international audience uh, today, so I'm very grateful to all of you who took the time to join our live sessions. We'll be back in just a few minutes with Dr. Takeshi Arimitsu uh, from Japan, sharing uh, chances and challenges of tiny babies. And I want to thank our sponsors, Midela, Water Wipes, and Prolacta Bioscience for their ongoing support. CPBF is a charitable uh, organization and 100% of all donations received this week will go to our support programs for families. To donate, please go to the CanadianPremies.org. Stay tuned as we will be back in just a few minutes uh, with Dr. Takesh. Thank you so much.